the focus of today is on the findings of the Welfare Conditionality Research Project. We're beginning with a presentation of the findings by Pete Dwyer, who's led the team and the other individual members of the team. And then in the afternoon, there'll be a panel of international experts who will each make their own individual response to those findings and then a broader discussion for the other participants at the conference. So, to business. Um, for today, what we want to do is we want to present our findings from the Welfare Conditionality Sanction and Support Project, which was a five-year project. Professor Smith there talked a lot about the department. I just want to make it clear that this project is a collaborative project, has been from day one, um, and it's the six universities on the slide there that have all been equally involved in producing this, this work. It's an Economic and Social Research Council funded piece of work, so it is independent academic uh, research. What I want to do just to start is to um, just say a little bit, very briefly, about the, the aims of the project. Essentially, we had uh, twin aims. We wanted to consider the ethicality and the efficacy of welfare conditionality. So, questions around fairness. Welfare conditionality has become embedded in welfare systems in the UK, uh, in many systems across the, across the world. Is it fair to organise uh, uh, welfare in this way and according to these kinds of principles? And then the next question is, does it work? How does it work for different people in different situations? Now, central to the project was field work with three sets of respondents. We did semi-structured interviews with 52 policy stakeholders. Some of these were former government ministers, senior civil servants, uh, regional and national uh, heads of organisations um, involved in, in the delivery of conditional welfare interventions. We also did 27 focus groups with frontline welfare practitioners. But at the heart of the project, and you're going to hear a lot about this today, was a repeat qualitative longitudinal panel study um, with a diverse sample of uh, what we call welfare service users subject to welfare conditionality. We were exploring welfare conditionality across a range of policy domains and groups. We know that it is a, a central element to social security policy, um, but it's also part and parcel of policy in relation to migration, uh, social housing, um, uh, parts of the criminal justice system, etc. So we did interviews with, with nine groups of, of respondents as set out on the slide. So there is breadth and depth within the, uh, the piece. We did the interviews, uh, the repeat qualitative longitudinal interviews, where people were interviewed up to three times across a two-year period at 12 monthly interviews in 11 locations in England and Scotland. We can say, I can say a bit more about um, um, those locations later on in questions if necessary. But what we want to do today is I want to start by considering the effectiveness of welfare conditionality within the social security benefit system and, and, and present you with our key findings. And there are several key points I want to make here. First of all, welfare conditionality within the social security system is largely ineffective in facilitating people's entry into or progression within the paid labour market over time. Indeed, what I've called stasis, a lack of significant and sustained change in employment status, was the most common outcome for, for the substantial majority of respondents across our repeat interviews. Second, there are good reasons why stasis may occur. It is not just that people choose to be idle. As in the, the uh, case on the, the slide, the first case there, serious long-term impairments can and do happen to individuals um, across the life course that stop them from working. Second, change when it did occur was rarely linear. What we had was short-term recycling of, between periods of, of, of insecure work back onto welfare. That was the norm for many. And when I say many, I'm referring to the minority of people within our sample who managed to find uh, work across the two-year period, some periods of works interspersed uh, with periods back on welfare. 
Thirdly, I'd just like to say that positive and sustained movements off welfare into work are rare and exceptional across the piece. They did occur. And indeed, when I do a paper uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about this, this, this woman here, who, who was uh, uh, called a joy, a joy for a reason, because it was a joy to see somebody who had been enabled into work, um, as the, the, the data says uh, on the slide. Perhaps more negatively, um, one of the key things is that for a substantial min minority of the people we spoke to, the implementation of welfare conditionality within the social security system regularly initiated and sustained a range of negative behaviour changes and outcomes. Now, one of the, the biggest issues I think that we came across was this issue that we're calling a culture of counterproductive compliance. And what this is about, essentially, is that when uh, work search uh, uh, requirements, training requirements, job search requirements, etc., are ramped up to the, the level they are in the UK, which is up to 35 hours a week of job search can be specified, actually meeting the conditions of your claim to ensure you do not get a benefit sanction becomes your job. You become focused on complying with the conditions of your claim and that gets in the way of meaningful, uh, uh, more meaningful work search, as the data on the top of the slide shows. Secondly, we found that on occasions other people simply chose to walk away from the hassle, the compulsion that is inherent within conditional social security systems and to disengage from the social security system altogether. This often, but not always, included people with additional vulnerabilities such as homelessness or alcohol or drug dependency issues. And these people moved away from collectivised systems of support. In some cases, welfare conditionality triggered moves into survival crime. The research also strongly evidenced how welfare conditionality leads to increased poverty and, in some cases, destitution, homelessness and destitution. And finally, for a significant number of people, welfare conditionality triggered or exacerbated existing health-related issues. The pressure inherent within conditionality, particularly for those with mental health impairments, pushed some people further away from the possibility of work rather than moving them uh, closer. My name's Lisa Scullion. I'm representing the University of Salford on the project. Um, I've got approximately three minutes to talk about some of the impacts of benefit sanctions, so I'm going to very quickly kind of give a whistle-stop tour of some of the main findings. There's three, there's three kind of key issues that, that we want to draw out um, from the interviews that we did across our welfare service users. Um, the first is looking at the kind of impacts of sanctions. Now, Peter's talked about this already. You have the kind of the financial impact. It was kind of profoundly negative. We, we don't have many examples of something positive happening as a result of someone being sanctioned. That probably won't come as a surprise to many people in this room. But across the sample, we found people experiencing debt, rent arrears, having to use food banks, having to rely on friends and family and social networks for support. Also, as the example that we've put on there illustrates, you have these kind of heat heat or eat choices that people are making around whether or not they can afford to buy food or whether they can heat their homes or whether they can pay the utilities. So it was impacting on the kind of their ability to, to live their day-to-day -day lives in terms of managing their finances. Now, in addition to that, as Peter has mentioned, as well as the kind of financial impacts, there's also the, the mental health impacts of sanctions, but not also experiencing a sanction. It's important to say that we found that the threat of being sanctioned was equally as, as devastating for people in terms of the mental health impacts. So it often exacerbated existing issues that people had. So existing mental health issues were worsened by being sanctioned or that, that threat of being sanctioned as part of the conditional system. But what we also found that 
for, for, for some people who may have never experienced mental health issues, sometimes these created stress and anxiety. So it's being sanctioned or the threat of sanction could actually create these situations for people. The second thing that, that we want to, to, um, to discuss in relation to the impact of sanctions is this idea of proportionality. The, the idea that is, is, is the current sanction regime, people being sanctioned, is it really proportional to the, to the so-called transgressions that, that people, people um, are committing? So we have people talking about kind of minor, being sanctioned for very minor transgressions or people having sanctions inappropriately applied. We've got many examples of people being sanctioned when they were a few minutes late for an appointment, and people in this room will have probably heard that within their own work. Um, we have examples of sanctions for administrative errors, and obviously now within universal credit, we have um, issues raised around whether it's right to be sanctioning people um, who are in work, because we have examples of that. So there's an issue around the kind of ethical que questions about whether it's proportionate, the sanction regime, to the misdemeanors that people um, are carrying out in, in relation to their benefit claims. There's an example up there of a person who had done everything in their power to explain to the job centre why they wouldn't be able to attend their appointment. This person uh, was attending their, their brother's funeral and they'd explain that to the job centre. Um, they thought that that information had been relayed back, but unfortunately it hadn't, and they had received a sanction for not attending their appointment. Now, the third point to make, and this is a very important point that relates back to what Peter was saying about questioning the effectiveness of conditionality more broadly. Our research shows that sanctions were ineffective in moving people closer to the labour market or into paid work, which runs counter really to what conditionality is supposed to be doing. We have, I think, probably only one, maybe two examples of people saying that a sanction had moved them into paid work. On the whole, people talked about sanctions as being counterproductive in terms of all the issues I've mentioned, in terms of creating mental health issues, creating increased debt. These things discourage people from moving into paid work. These things create barriers to people moving into paid work. And, and for many people, it was seen as, very, as a punishment and very demoralising that their efforts had led to being sanctioned. So, as Lisa said, sanctions don't work. Uh, what about the support side? There's a balance between sanctions and support in any social security system. What we found was that sanctions dominated the support system. So there wasn't really a distinct separation between sanctions on the one hand and support on the other. For most people that we spoke to, support was sanctions based. So this in-work universal credit recipient says, I feel criminalised, and that's very powerful. This is someone who already has a job claiming benefits as a top-up for low income, who was sanctioned because they missed their appointment at Job Centre Plus because they were working. And that feeling uh, was very dominant amongst the people that we spoke to. It wasn't just about being sanctioned, it was the ever-present threat of sanction that really shaped the whole encounter and the whole support service. The support system in the UK is uh, very minimal, it's very low cost, it's cheap by international standards. Support really is self-help, it's do-it-yourself job search is the main focus of the support system. But that self-help is also infused with surveillance. So the system that most people uh, thought of when we mentioned support to them was Universal Job Match, which was the online vacancy system that most people were using. But work coaches could see the vacancies that people were applying for, uh, the entries were date stamped, so a work coach could see if someone had gone into the system or not, how long they'd spent on it, and what they'd done when they were there. And that's what led this uh, job seeker in Scotland to say, Big Brother is watching you, you're getting spied on. So the whole support system was completely infused with surveillance. People are very much on their own to find work, is what another lone parent told us. The support was really lacking uh, for most people. <clears throat> 
So support is low quality and it's also ineffective. So when we're thinking about the balance between sanctions and support, sanctions are very heavy and support is very minimal. One uh, migrant said, what helped me get a job had nothing to do with the job centre. And another uh, job seeker said, they're doing nothing to help me at all, apart from sending me on stupid courses, which are a waste of time. And that uh, sense of having time wasted was part of the counterproductive aspect of the whole system, which went through support as well as through sanctions. The first point to make is that these groups faced multiple uh, barriers to employment. Frequently, mental and physical health issues, alcohol and drug dependency, insecure accommodation with often histories of homelessness, poverty and institutionalisation. Many of the samples spent time in children's homes and much of their adult life uh, churning in and out of prison, serving short sentences. But despite that history, most had had a history of employment. It's not, there were very few people in the sample that had never worked. Rather, most had worked sporadically in low-paid, low-skilled work, often in construction and often manual work. But work itself was chronically insecure. It, it rarely lasted more than a day, a week, rarely a few months. Um, so there was that history of engagement with the labour market despite all those sort of barriers. The second point to make really is that behaviour change, perhaps not surprisingly, was very challenging for these groups and rarely linear. And over the two year period we often saw individuals uh, make significant progress in order to relapse. In terms of uh, the effectiveness of uh, stabilising individuals' behaviour, there were two or three key types of support. Um, certainly those that had had a history of claiming benefits with high levels of conditionality and being sanctioned, if they moved to lower levels of conditionality associated with benefits like ESA support and resolved accommodation problems, uh, that often stabilised an individual's behaviour. And for those uh, with alcohol and drug dependency, quite often uh, moving to another area of the country or developing another social network was a key stabilising factor for those individuals. I think the third point I'd make is that uh, welfare conditionality itself was most effective when it was tied to meaningful support. And the word meaningful is the operative word here. And there are two groups where we actually saw that in the sample. There was a small number of individuals that were involved in family intervention projects and they received intensive, personalised and holistic support, uh, which had transformed their behaviour over the two years that we were interacting with them. And the second group was a, a small number of short sentence prisoners who received through the gate support and received quite a lot of help. They'd been helped to claim the uh, most appropriate benefit. They'd been helped to find somewhere to live. Some of them had un undergone vocational training courses in construction related skills. And at the end of the two years, we found those individuals gainfully employed in employment and no longer offending. Uh, but as I say, they were the exceptions rather than the rules. In terms of the employment support, um, what the research found is that there are two key weaknesses. I mean, Sharon's touched on some of this already in terms of support for this group. Um, the first of which is that individuals had relatively little employment support. There was some help with CVs, some help with some sort of internet job search training, but often people were complaining that they had very little help from the job centre. Um, when we asked the question, what sort of employment help would they like, invariably they mentioned vocational training. And given their past experiences, they often mentioned construction skills training. So that was one weakness. And the second weakness of the support that's been pioneered by Job Centre Plus is its reliance on CVs and the internet. For many of the people in our sample, they've no experience of searching for work using CVs or the internet. They use their personal social networks. 
uh, to get work. Um, and that, that's an important point for another reason, because in terms of applying, supplying evidence of job search, they were asked to use methods that they'd got no experience of using, the internet. So often, they were being subjected to sanctions. Just want to start off by focusing on a couple of kind of dynamics of how behaviour change might occur and the link to support and sanctions within, within that. The first point to make, of course, is that the individual subject to sanction support is, remains at the heart of this and where we did get some of the, the successful change that Dell mentioned, that was linked to individual decisions um, to change and I think that's important to remember the dynamism of the, over the life course in particular periods. So often where people uh, involved in alleged antisocial behaviour or in family intervention projects did change, it was often down to a, a, heis, a, a health crisis, a feeling that hit rock bottom. Um, children were often very influential, uh, or having children. The ageing process is a major factor in people moving out of antisocial uh, behaviour or a desire for a better life. We found some but not much evidence that the threat of a sanction itself could act as a catalyst for that personal decision to change. But that decision to change is not easy. And the second point I wanted to make was just about the, the personal sacrifices that are actually involved when you're trying to take um, a particular groups, offenders and ASB, sanctions are often treated or even support as the first form of intervention. Um, that people experience and they're often labelled as kind of early intervention. We need to remember for these groups, this is, they are often a response to what has been a lifetime of difficulty and vulnerability and including in their own, their own childhood. And the key building blocks of change, such as self-esteem and self-confidence, will always take um, a long time. Um, and it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy for people to, for example, accept and admit to somebody else there's a problem with, with parenting. It's not easy to change your, your habits and your routines and it's often not easy to change your social networks. And I wanted to make two quick points related to that. Firstly, we need to remember that whether it's sanctions or support or a combination, that is only one influence on individuals who are, who are social beings. And I think sometimes we focus on the sanction support as if they take place in a, in a vacuum and of course that is not the case. And the second point is there are, there are wider social influences at play here. And one of the interesting things about the so-called antisocial group, well, they are not asocial. Um, they not only have, they have their own networks, but they often, many of them, accepted the principles of conditionality and also accepted the fact that the behaviour they had been involved in needed to be addressed and needed to, to change. And again, I think sometimes when we got caught up in the, the logical paradigm and the economic financial paradigm of sanctions, we forget about those other social influences. Thirdly, um, just to emphasise the relationship of key workers and practitioners in, in this, this is not a simple thing about a particular sanction on a bit of paper, etc. The relationship with key workers um, was absolutely key and often the extent of discretion available to key workers made a big difference. And it is that combination of a, of a form of effective support and the relationship between the subjects and the workers that is at the heart of all, of all this. And then just to conclude with two points, and firstly a rather depressing point, I think, about our failure to learn good practice and transfer it across policy domains. Dell mentioned two examples at the end of his previous slide. So in relation to family intervention projects, and indeed, I think, uh, uh, efforts to address antisocial behaviour over the last 20 or 30 years, we actually know quite a lot about what works and we know the importance of, of personalised interventions, interventions that have long enough to understand the actual causal factors, interventions that look at a holistic uh, whole family approach and try to link people to support. So we know all that and we know that that's got a relatively successful track record with some of the most vulnerable households in this country. But the depressing thing is, of course, all these good practice points I've just told you about is in absolute stark contrast to what happens in the, the employment benefits side, which is much more impersonalised and, and, and automated. So there's a, there's, a, there's a contrast, and the people in these groups told us that repeatedly. They themselves repeatedly compared their experiences of family intervention projects with employment-related benefit um, sanctions.
And then just finally, because I do think it's important to remember the practitioners, just to stress again the point that not only do conditionality regimes change the individual subject to them, they are fundamentally transforming um, the roles and, and work of a whole range of practitioners who support and work with some of the, the most vulnerable, and of course also supporting and changing the nature of that relationship. So for example, family intervention project workers that spend an ever-escalating amount of time with their clients trying to negotiate the sanctions regime rather than providing other folks of, of what would be more fruitful in interventions. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, what we found in this research with regards to the deployment of various forms of conditionality to uh, people experiencing street homelessness and homelessness and also in the social housing sphere. Those who are street homeless, uh, especially in England, have been targeted by a range of conditional and enforcement mechanisms seeking to change their behaviour. So the behaviours we're talking about here aren't necessarily engagement with the labour market. Um, they might include that. I'll come back to that in a second. But they might be focused on um, encouraging homeless people to come inside, to access support, to take up accommodation offers, um, to desist from begging or street dr drinking or engage with support around substance misuse. Um, and the kinds of measures I'm talking about here are arrests or threats of arrest um, for begging or rough sleeping under the Vagrancy Act. Also things like antisocial behaviour orders and other um, civil orders, public space protection orders, which can require rough sleepers to move away from particular areas or stop doing particular kinds of things. So in the cohort of interviews we undertook with people who had experienced these kinds of interventions, um, what we found was that they were quite high-risk approaches and they had very variable impacts depending on the individual in question. Sometimes, in combination with support, they did prompt a discontinuation uh, of problematic forms of behaviour or foster engagement with support. Sometimes they had no impact at all, people just carried on as usual. Um, and sometimes they uh, had a much more negative impact and displaced those experiencing street homelessness into other places, so that could be out of urban centres and away from outreach support and other forms of support, and that could be more dangerous um, parts of the city. Um, and also sometimes displace them into other forms of um, behaviours, so instead of begging they would seek uh, to make money in other ways that could be even more damaging, even more socially undesirable. What we found very clearly was that the most reliable route to changing the behaviour of this group, if that was your policy aim, uh, is to provide them with stable accommodation and personalised support to deal with the challenges that they face. Of course, many homeless people uh, are also subject to the kinds of conditionality that my colleagues have been talking to you about um, within the benefit system. And echoing the findings of the research on those other themes, we didn't find that conditionality for this group enhanced motivation to seek work. And sometimes they led to very negative, unintended consequences. Um, if people couldn't receive income through the benefit system, um, they resorted to begging and sometimes even acquisitive um, crime. Also, they led to a considerable amount of distress for some of the reasons that Dell was talking about in relation to the offender group. Um, and I think a concern that I would particularly want to emphasise is that the level of distress associated with the benefit system and sanctioning um, actually drove some of these already very vulnerable groups completely away from the social security system and away from the income and support that that might be able to provide them with. So just a couple of minutes on social housing. Our particular focus here was on the use of probationary tenancies and fixed term tenancies within the social housing um, sector the latter of which were introduced in 2012 and enabled social landlords, instead of providing a traditional lifetime tenancy that tenants could stay in for as long as they wanted, um, to give one of a fixed term. And the government advised at the time that the renewal, or not, of that tenancy at the end of the five years often, that it would last, would relate to um, income or employment status, um, under occupation, um, and a range of behavioural factors. So in the cohort of tenants we spoke to, we found um, very little evidence of behaviour change um, and no evidence of positive behaviour change. The only slightly detectable behavioural impact was that people were less willing to invest in their properties, buy new carpets, tend to the garden, because they weren't sure whether they were going to be there for the long term. But the fixed term tenancies did have an impact um, on tenants' sense of well-being. So some tenants, concerningly, weren't really aware they were on a fixed term tenancy, so there was no impact there. 
Um, others were unconcerned about the fixed term nature of their tenancy, and that was um, often because they'd come to social housing through the homelessness route or from a private sector tenancy, by comparison to which five years is, is pretty stable and pretty good. Um, but for another group, um, they were anxious and some even very distressed about the lack of security associated with their housing. And this was especially the case for older households, those with health problems, um, and for some families with children. And you can see in the quote here, um, a sense of kind of apprehension, never being able to quite relax and enjoy the home because of the uncertainty around whether they would be able to stay there in the long term. I think it's also critical just to mention that fixed-term tenancies were introduced um, partly to try and foster positive behaviour change on the part of tenants, but also to aid social landlords in the efficient use of stock, so shuffling under-occupying households around, that kind of thing, filtering out higher-income households. And social landlords we spoke to were really sceptical that they were seeing any positive impacts um, in that regard and were very, very concerned about the administrative burden of having to review, um, renew or decide not to renew tenancies um, every five years. Our recommendations to, to policymakers, based on um, the analysis we've done, the research we've done, over the past the past five years now we've given you the main points of the uh, um, the findings today but obviously quite quickly you've all got an overview in your packs uh, i would refer you to that where we've, we've we've got some more detail on some of these things and also there are nine other papers uh, that relate to each each group so lone parents disability uh, universal credit claimants etc uh, of a similar 12 to 16 pages length well, essentially, when we got to the end of the project, we had a number of recommendations for policymakers based on, on, on our research and the evidence that we, we've put forward. And first of all, we think there's a pressing need to rebalance conditionality within the UK system. Um, we've got to reduce this preoccupation with sanctions and sanctions back compliance and increase the em emphasis on the provision of personalised employment support. Where people did get into employment, it was because the mandatory employment support on offer was appropriate to them and offered um, in the right manner. Secondly, we think that the use of benefit sanctions needs to be reviewed. Um, issues relating to severity, um, whether or not a warning system uh, a so-called yellow card system where somebody gets a warning uh, uh, for a first offence, whether or not that may be appropriate, um, need to be uh, um, considered. Certainly there's a, a pressing need to improve communication with recipients. Many people didn't know they were uh, initially sanctioned, people didn't understand why they were sanctioned, and often if you don't know what you're meant to do, you can't do it. So you can't instigate positive behaviour change. Um, and we also think that there needs to be a review of the way sanctions are applied to many vulnerable groups, because this is obviously causing hardship uh, to people um, in very severe ways on occasions. There is a need as well to address the variations and inconsistencies in easement implementation. Essentially, within the current system, there is a system of easements where a work coach can use their discretion, increasingly under universal credit, this is his discretionary power, to say to somebody, well, you are a lone parent, for example, I accept that you cannot work between the hours of 8.30 and 9.30, etc., and that you've got to pick your kids up from school in the afternoon. We can ease the kind of uh, job search requirements that you look for, particular jobs, the, the hours, etc. Similar um, uh, easements uh, relate to, to other groups. But at the moment, these easements are not being applied. And essentially, this isn't because all work coaches are nasty people. I'll be frank, from evidence, some of them are, uh, and some of them do um, uh, uh, take a quite severe approach to the way that they implement policy at the front line. But many of the work coaches are themselves up against huge time pressures, huge caseloads. And they may not have sufficient training, uh, uh, to understand the needs of a particular group, disabled people, lone parents, etc. And certainly, often, they haven't got sufficient time to sit down with that individual uh, when the claimant commitment uh, 
at the beginning of the, uh, the process of claiming a benefit is worked out. The claimant commitment is an interesting thing. Essentially, it's meant to be an agreement between the work coach and the uh, recipient of the benefit about their personalised work search requirements that are meant to be adapted to their particular needs. These, these, these interviews for claimant commitments last on average 10 minutes. Often, issues of vulnerability, issues of impairment are not uh, communicated. Um, and this may be because of, of the sort of inequality in the discussion. You know, we've, we've talked to people who sit there and say yes to everything because they fear if they say no, they may face a benefit sanction. Certainly, um, what work coaches need is the time and the resources to be able to set um, uh, claimant commitments appropriately if we're going to use welfare conditionality and review those and adjust them over time because often this did not occur. Sharon touched upon the, um, the quality of the mandatory um, job search support and skills training made available through either Job Centre Plus programmes or work, work programme uh, private providers. And although there, was, uh, there were rather certain examples of good practice highlighted across uh, the project, that training certainly needs to be more, more, more vocational, employment focused, flexibly, flexibly implemented and personally tailored. The number of times we, we heard people say, I've been on another CV writing course, I can write a CV, um, it's shot across the, uh, across the piece. Um, basically, you know, people going on courses for this year, hell of it because they knew they had to that this did not improve their chances of employment. Picking up on, on Beth's points, um, um, Beth and her colleagues at Harriet Watt um, uh, did the work on, on social housing and basically they think that, that fixed term tenancies should be abandoned and I might add I agree based on the evidence. You know there is a lack of discernible positive impact on tenant behaviour um, and it's unlikely to generate substantial additional lettings to free up stock, uh, which is under pressure in the social housing market. So there's a lot of stuff going on there, just apparently for the sake of it. Um, we do believe that there is a need to conduct a, a comprehensive review of the continued use of welfare conditionality. There is a growing body of evidence, international, national, about the ineffectiveness of intensified and extensified systems of conditionality in moving people off social security benefits and into work. And this is particularly the case uh, with certain groups uh, of, of claimants. And that's why on the, the, the final recommendation that we make is the need to pause the wider application of conditionality for particular groups. And we need to think clearly if this is the kind of welfare system, of social security system, that we want questions of ethics for vulnerable people. We also need to think, is this useful? Does this just deflect problems away from the, uh, um, uh, the social security system, the social housing system, whatever, and push people um, onto uh, charitable provision or into poverty? So we would say that uh, in relation to disabled people, those dealing with homelessness and or drink or drug alcohol dependency issues, um, um, we need to reconsider whether this is the best way forward. Much of the evidence finds that those kinds of people are not assisted into work in any great numbers by these kinds of regimes. And finally, in work universal credit um, uh, conditionality. We think that this needs reconsidering. We think that this was a policy that sort of appeared out of nowhere, uh, a sort of unthought through thing. Well, we're going to have uh, a universal credit, we've got conditionality for out of work claimants, or we've got to have conditionality for those who are in receipt of in work um, wage supplements, low wage supplements, housing benefits, etc. And for me, and for the team, I think, I can speak for the team, they're nodding, this has not been thought through. And it's idiotic. We have got people, at its worst, it is idiotic. Let me temper that. Um, 
But we've got people who've been phoned up by a job coach and said, I want you to come to an interview to discuss your progression, and get another job, etc. your hours tomorrow. And they've said, I can't come because I'm working. And they said, well, if you don't come, we're going to sanction you. Now, plainly, that is idiocy. A policy designed to enable people to engage in the paid labour market that is sanctioning them precisely because they're doing that. And universal credit is a big, big noise at the moment uh, in the UK and internationally it's, it's growing attention. It's something the UK is leading the field in. Um, and if you're thinking of doing it um, in your particular countries, those overseas, think long and hard about the use of in-work conditionality. Because if you're going to get this uh, in your system, you've got to get it right. I think I'll finish on that point. Thanks very much.